what's the primary differentiator between that and some of the stuff that crypto seems to be working on? Markets are actually artificial intelligence machines that are centuries old. The commodities market right now, with the supply chain constraints that are coming down the pike with the economy and the kind of regionalization of everything. Yeah, some of these things are going viral. All right, in today's episode, I'm talking to Noah Healy. Noah is the founder of CoreDisk. And at CoreDisk, they're trying to build a better commodities market. I tell you what, this was one of the most interesting conversations that I've had to date because talking to this guy, he just has such a unique and in-depth understanding of markets, of information, of programming, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. So let's go ahead and hop into that interview. I'm really happy here. We've got Noah Healy, and he's the founder at CoreDisk. Is that, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, I usually pronounce it CoreDisk, although you can... Uh, separate the O's into core disk because it's from coordination is where that opener comes from. Yeah, it's a really interesting company. When we got connected, I saw a professional algorithm algorithm developer and mathematician. I was like, oh, this is going to be fun because he's playing in commodity markets and he's got some stuff on there about the economy. And this sounds like somebody that I definitely need to talk to. So Noah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me here. What's the process that's led you here on your journey of developing algorithms? I'm sure you've got some pretty fantastic stories of the different industries that you've worked in. Basically, needing a supply of food is what got me to where I am today. So I got out of school, yeah. <laughs> needed a job. Easiest industry to get jobs in in the year 2000 was dot-com startups. And so jumped in there and started studying the language that they used. I wasn't much of a programmer in college, but also going the next step to studying the mathematics of the languages and the underpinning stuff. And that's where you find out that actually there's this brilliant and insanely powerful mathematics that has just really been developed in the last hundred-ish years to describe thought and imagination and action so clearly that we can even get machines to do things for us. And mm -hmm. that's just an incredibly powerful playground to live in. And it turns out that I have a, a natural facility for various parts of it. There were plenty of false starts and errors along the way, but certain structural things with strings, numbers, and data structures, I find to be much more congenial and natural than apparently most people find them. And so mm -hmm. that I made it my vocation and avocation. And then you keep going for a couple of decades and eventually turn over a spade and there's something pretty cool underneath it. Yeah, it sounds like that you've worked across the dot com company that you worked in originally of note, or was it was it just getting your feet wet and then just moving along to different things that were interesting to you? Mostly just getting in. I learned a pretty valuable programming language, Perl at the time. It was very widespread. Even today it's one of the most widely available languages on earth. And it has some pretty nice tools for doing string manipulation and system automation tasks, which means that it's still pretty useful to this day. The company I was working for is called Boxer Jam. It's long kaput, but they were innovators in the social gaming sector. Unfortunately, they didn't work out their revenue model. It got laid off. I got hired at the beginning of the year. I got laid off at the end of the year. And that was a pattern in the first several companies that I wound up working for. That changes your relationship to jobs and careers, certainly. But yeah. one of the, the core concepts as you get into it is that effectively the most powerful thing you can do with computers and with tasks is to develop programming languages. And so that gives you the capacity to effectively build tools that can be used and repurposed by themselves as well as others. And so mm -hmm. it allows you to simultaneously explore a space to learn about it. And also everything that you learn pretty much is instantaneously turned into sort of production grade finished product that just does stuff by itself from then on. So that's a lot of what I do is automating uh, internal company processes 
building languages around them so that the process can continue even in my absence. And that's what got me where I am now, just figuring out mm -hmm. how to build those things, what sort of tools exist, how to create valuable abstractions that both computers and humans can work on easily is that's the skill set basically that makes a lot of sense and you know, that translation you just say you're able to translate between the two and yeah uh, yeah that's we're starting to see people foraying into this with the chat gpt thing because essentially what open ai has done is built an incredibly large language model so that the computer will have reached back across the aisle and try to create some things. But we're seeing the cracks in the missing material. There's certain kinds of things like college sophomore essays that basically <laughs> it was handed a lot of, and it's very good at producing and they are perfectly decently produced and they look great and everything. But then there's other things like budgets or anything that involves second order mathematics or a few digits of computation and it's mm -hmm. not solid on any of those things yet so people still have to supply all of the actual making sense parts of making things make sense so far yeah and it seems like when you're looking at chat gpt it's just another evolution and step up because in so many industries, organizations, there's a certain lower tier. I would say it's similar to in the past, you write down a letter and send it or all your accounting stuff was done by hand. There's a certain remedial level that happens and technology comes along and takes that part out of it and allows you to accelerate what you can do with it. Yeah. So one, I think, very clear thing that people don't generally talk about is that Amazon is one of the premier users of computational resources on earth today. Mm -hmm. Amazon is in a very analogous business to Sears Roebuck from a century ago. And the now Willis Tower, but the Sears Tower in Chicago was one of the biggest office buildings ever built. And the reason it was built was because computers didn't exist. And the only way to do the processing, accounting, and so on to manage a continent scale retail distribution mail system was to have 110 floors of, of clerks and secretaries and hand calculators and so on to do all the paperwork. And so they built one and work that they were doing could be replicated by a chip that's in your phone today, but they didn't have that phone. They didn't have that chip. And so they had to have mm -hmm. a lot of people doing it instead. Yeah, once again, seeing how technology grows and now Amazon's able to take some of that computing power, put it with some robots who know how to take a shelf to a specific point at a specific place in time based on who needs to grab what item. And in the past, that was a human walking all the way across. And now you know they're able to take that computing power and put it towards robotics, towards logistics, towards anything that's predictive. Yeah. And that completely changes the game for how we put mm -hmm. our societies together. I'm not a commodities trader, but it seems like just taking some of the ways that capitalism used to run when information was scarce and just trying to make it more readily available and remove some of the gate previous gatekeepers and allow things to be a little more open and transparent and trustless. Is that, is there, am I hitting on some of it? Some of it? Yeah, those are good thoughts. Thing that is, I found underappreciated is that markets are actually artificial intelligence machines that are centuries old. Mm -hmm. And so they predate computers, but they're using learning algorithms intrinsically. And they're not just people talking to each other. There's also critical pieces of mechanical aid to make broadcast of information more clear and known to be universal. And those are important qualities of how communication occurs. There's a real difference between how we're talking right now and how we might talk if we were sitting in a cafe or in my living room because this isn't just a private conversation. This is going out to the world at some point. Those changes are important and are important to how markets learned how to figure out where buyers and sellers were going to come together. But 
that algorithm is, again, it's centuries old, and we've learned an enormous amount about learning and optimization algorithms just in the last couple decades. And what learning systems are essentially doing is taking on a raw chaos stream of data, filtering out the noise and boosting the signal. And what yeah. computers do for us is radically increase the size and noise level of that chaos stream. And so markets are quite simply being overwhelmed by information that's irrelevant and in many cases harmful. Mm -hmm. And so we need more robust algorithms to do that noise cancellation and signal boosting, or we're just going to watch the markets fail. And so if we're to put that in language for the audience, is some of it that the way the markets are written, like I saw in your deck, there's farmers that want to sell wheat and bakers that want to buy wheat, right? And there's all right. of these different extra noise. The noise can be done by having large sums of money where you're going in and trying to move the market, move the market by purchasing that. You've got the speculators who are out trying to figure out what things are doing. You've got the weather that's coming in. What are some of the other areas of noise that you see that are affecting the markets? So one interesting issue is at the control feedback level. So are you familiar with the concepts of positive and negative feedback? Roughly. In control okay. systems, positive feedback is when a control action essentially causes an effect action that's an amplification of the control action. And a negative feedback is one where there's a lessened effect. And I use a lot of car analogies because lots of people drive. Mm -hmm. Positive feedback works the way that your brakes work. Negative feedback works the way that your gas works. So okay. if you slam on the brakes, as a result of slamming on the brakes, your car suddenly slows down and that increases the weight of your foot on the brake and causes the brake to slam on more. And if you don't have traction control, this can very easily cause you to lock up or over brake in certain circumstances. If you were to slam on the gas, this would immediately accelerate your car and would actually pull your foot back up off the gas as you're sort of pushed back into your seat. So negative feedback systems have this trait that they are easier to find control and easier to equilibrate. Because as you approach the equilibrium point, the negative feedback causes you to gain greater and tighter control of what's going on. Whereas positive feedback systems have this trait that they swing wildly and chaotically because as you approach the tipping point, you tip over and fall, and then you have to come back. And then as you get to the tipping point again, you trip again and fall again. Markets in present design are positive feedback systems. If you think prices are too low, you should buy. And if you think they're too high, you should sell. What happens to the market if you're buying? It goes up. So you think the market should go up. And as a result of that, you cause the market to go up. You're a genius. You're always guaranteed to be right. <laughs> now, yeah. it might collapse again even faster than you tried to sell to take advantage of the buying that you just did. But just mm -hmm. that fact alone, and the fact that merely speculating the market changes the valence of the market and causes it to essentially conform to your own wishes, means that there's effectively a self-chaos or self-noise generating quality of that marketplace. And what we've okay. been seeing happen is many new voices entering the marketplace with computerization. And so with positive feedback being available to each and every individual, what now happens is any time there's a sort of slight destabilization in the number of people who are on one or another side of a trade, you get a flash crash or a flash boom, which then needs to counter correct and won't correct instantaneously or correctly. There'll be a aftershock type effect from these events. And 
these things are effectively daily occurrences across the economy, whereas that wasn't really much of a thing back when markets were operating at much lower scale in the coffee houses of Renaissance Italy, because those mm -hmm. 30 guys didn't have 10,000 voices in their ear all shouting sell or buy at the same time. So as the financial markets mature and you get into algorithmic trading bots, stuff like that, it further exacerbates it because you're only limited. You've got the human stuff happening, but then you've got the bots that are able to trade at increased frequency and they are limited by the coding and the inputs that they have. Sure. Let's say you connect up a learning algorithm to your bot to try to figure out how to make money in the marketplace, which is a thing that multiple mm -hmm. people have done, some of them very successfully. In an environment where these sorts of falling off the table events are frequent, the bots are going to notice that they happen mm -hmm. and start learning how to uh, trigger them without costing themselves very much money or recognize when they're going to be happening in ways that they can take advantage of. And this can all be fully black boxed. Nobody can actually want this to happen, but the bot is just, I need to learn how to make money. And I've observed that when this starts to happen and then that starts to happen and the bots are in a competitive environment with one another. So they're basically all trying to find these things. And the thing is in the current market structure, the participants as a whole make more money the more chaotic the markets are because the crazier things are, the worse a deal people that are coming to the marketplaces looking for stability are going to be willing to take. If a door-to-door -door fire sale, fire insurance salesman comes to your house, you might you kick him off your lawn. But if both of your neighbor's house burned down yesterday, you might be willing to hear him out at that point. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is these markets are essentially constantly on fire. And so people are willing to pull back, not participate or come in to take the first best deal they can get, which is generally not very good. And that leads mm -hmm. to price increases that, that then promulgate across the entire supply chain. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So then if part of the problem is that it is a positive feedback, how do you work to try to make it more of a negative feedback loop? So, uh, that how... would be that would be ideal. What I managed to develop was neutral feedback. Okay. I spent quite some time trying to figure out how to make my system into a negative feedback system, and I couldn't really do that. I also spent a certain amount of time trying to figure out how to work out what the ideal possible system was. And I could neither figure out what the ideal possible system was, nor could I figure out whether or not it's possible to prove that you can't figure out what the ideal possible system is. I suspect that you can't really okay. work out what the ideal possible system is, but that could easily just be my ego assuaging my failure. But there's certain reasons around optimization theory to think that there's probably always a little bit left in the tank in trying to solve some of these computational information problems. So anyhow, what my system does is allows the speculators to integrate their opinions together and then takes that number that they come up with and effectively auditions it to the buyers and sellers. So mm -hmm. the buyers and sellers are presented with a price for today projections for prices tomorrow and into the future and asked how they feel. Do you want to actually buy or sell at these prices that we came up with? And when they do, the commissions from that then pay off the speculators for their information. But if they don't, if they come up with weird and bizarre prices, which aren't profitable for producers or aren't tolerable to consumers, then one side or the other isn't going to come to the party. And then there, the money won't be there to, for the speculation. And so this gives you a situation where the sort of return from speculators comes from this third party action as a result of what they're doing. So it is still the case that if you think the price is too low, you do something that raises the price, but you aren't getting paid off from that. You're getting paid off from other people's participation at that level, not just if you managed to find a counterparty that was 
stupid or desperate enough to have to hit that particular piece of bait. So it, it sounds like it's a way to take the experts and add some clarity and transparency to the information that they have. Is uh, that a right way to, sit, to describe it? Yeah, absolutely. My observation is that the way that we think about trade as let's say I make wheat and you make bread. And so we come together and I sell you wheat so you can bake your bread. That's a perfectly clear model, but what it's obscuring is that it's not just about my wheat and your money that you can buy wheat with. There's a third quality of the information. I've got a business and I know how much it costs me to make wheat and what kind of profitability things that I have. You have a business and you know how valuable wheat is and you have the other half of the value chain essentially mm -hmm. and so how our information can merge together is critical to that deal and in mm -hmm. a one-on-one -on -one, we could negotiate virtually anything maybe i'm doing very well and you're very desperate and so i can basically sell you sell you wheat for so much money that you're just barely able to stay in business. Or maybe mm -hmm. I'm very desperate and you're doing very well and you can buy the wheat for so little that I can just barely remain in business. If we've commoditized the wheat, and so there's a lot of potential producers and a lot of potential consumers, then we need a more sophisticated networked negotiation because I don't care about your business and you don't care about my business. We each need to get mm -hmm. into a condition where our businesses can do well for ourselves. And so do thousands or tens of thousands of other parties on each side of this trade. And so mm -hmm. there is, in fact, there must be some kind of middle ground between these two groups that is effectively economically maximizing. And mm -hmm. between all of us, if we were all honest and open with each other, we would actually know what that number was. And so this provides a forum for people to share that information in a fashion that's open and honest, because that's what grants you the highest possible rate of return for the information that you have. Gotcha. How does it get implemented into an existing market? Or do you have to actually create your own market entirely for it? You do have to create a new marketplace, although existing market operators could create parallel marketplaces that would operate in this fashion. Brokers would also have potentially the client base and regulatory capacity to set one of these things up. So that's another potential. Mm -hmm. But yeah, because this is working on completely different principles, it's not something that you can erect within the existing market structure. Part of what makes this work is actually restrictions on what people can actually do within this space. And one of the sort of plus sides of the existing markets is that there's so much flexibility that you can effectively create any kind of deal you can imagine. And that's actually bad in a cooperative environment because it includes essentially evil deals means that because other people can be doing things that are singularly harmful to you, you have to behave in ways that defends you from that harm. And that behavior is lowering the economic potential of the overall marketplace. Okay. That's a fascinating problem to be solving. I don't remember asking this, but how did you come to that? How did you pick the commodity markets? How did you just see that and jump into this? I was looking for fascinating problems to solve. I was interested mm -hmm. in the problem of finding consensus in a networked scenario. I was thinking more in terms of like IOT or I'd worked for several companies where management had zigged when they absolutely should not have zigged. And there were files mm -hmm. in the company that had the data that said that doing what they were doing was very dumb and going to fail and then reported that it was failing and either the information never got to them, which I'm pretty sure is what happened, or it got to them and they just completely ignored it. But I've seen this, I've seen this play out multiple times where now that we have computers, we have these insane funds of information about our lives and our businesses that are so insane, we can't actually exploit them in any useful. Way. And what technologists are mostly doing is increasing channel volume 
making it so that we can create even more information that we currently aren't even paying any attention to. Since I don't really see any particular future in lowering channel volumes and reduction of bandwidth, like I don't see anybody buying into that, it occurred to me that it'd be a very interesting problem if any sort of progress could be made to work out this consensus problem. And I'm not the originator of the, that thought. There's a lot of work that's been done on how consensus and communication can happen in networked or unreliable circumstances. One of the core problems is something called the Byzantine generals problem. And the notion is that you are one of some number of Byzantine generals that are all surrounding you're in the mountains and you and the other generals are all in the mountains surrounding this town. And you can send runners to the other generals, but each runner has some percentage chance that they'll get captured. And some of the generals might be traitors and mm -hmm. you can assign various percentage chances to generals being traitors. And there's some threshold. If a certain number of you all attack the town at the same time, then you'll win. And if less than that number ever attacks the town, then those armies will be savaged. So how should you proceed to communicate and coordinate an attack under those circumstances? And we know the answer to that problem. It's very complicated, but it turns out that you can plug in those numbers and the percentages and everything else and get out the precise right answer of which runners you should send to which generals. And it doesn't mean the attack will work, but it will maximize your chance of success. That research underlies TCP IP. The way that we talk on the internet mm -hmm. operates that way because the internet is based off this idea that communications aren't actually stable or reliable. I send a message, that's it, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Did it get there? What if when you get a message, you send me a message back saying you got the message and what the message was. And mm -hmm. then when I get a message saying that I got the message, I send you a message saying, okay, that's the message I sent. And we agree mm -hmm. that's just how we do things here. That's how the internet works is this kind of very asynchronous catch it, catch can type thing. And that's essentially how the Byzantine general should behave in their situation. So anyhow, that's what I was working on. I was, this is a very interesting problem. I think it's probably got some actual applications and it's something I'd like to think about. I was looking into game theory as an approach because there's a class of games called coordination games that are also known as stagnation games because they have the property that once a group playing them comes to a common understanding, they become very stable. People just mm -hmm. keep doing what they're doing. So that seemed to me to be a sort of good consensus making tool is some sort of game that once you got to a consensus, you stayed there. The problem of course, and the word stagnation immediately suggests it is that mm -hmm. people tend to stay where they are, even when where they are is a pretty bad place to be. So how yeah. do you modify a stagnation game? so that it can kick itself out when there is a better option. And that's where I started thinking about adding a computer program to the game that would be able to signal everybody because a computer can send out a million messages as you can send out one. It mm -hmm. doesn't have any opinions of its own, so it can operate very transparently and isn't manipulating the game. And it can be the custodian of costs and punishments and rewards so that when people do something that elevates the game for everybody, they can receive a prize for doing so, so that people will try to elevate the game for everybody. And that when people lower the game for everybody, they can receive a punishment so that people don't do that again or ever, hopefully. And I call that new kind of system a negotiation game, because that's very much what negotiation about is coming together, mm -hmm. but this allows negotiation again, to become depersonalized from just a one-on-one -on -one to a multi point of view, many simultaneous player type situation where an entire network can come together around their own common interests. Okay. 
what's the primary differentiator between that and some of the stuff that crypto seems to be working on with the distributed ledger and consensus that it's coming to and some of the way there are automated market makers in that. And it's, are we in the same vein? Is it a different thing? or So you've mentioned two completely different pieces of technology. So crypto has automated market okay, makers yeah. and crypto has the blockchain consensus algorithm. The mm -hmm. blockchain consensus algorithm is actually not a condition of common understanding. It's a condition of mutually agreed statements. So it's perfectly okay. possible for you to get out on the Bitcoin blockchain and put down the statement, Noah has a stupid face. And it's perfectly possible for me to write down right next to it, Noah's face isn't that stupid. And so those two things would then live on the blockchain forever. And that's not mm -hmm. a consensus situation. That's you have one opinion, which is now recorded on a medium, which won't go away and will stay that way. And I have expressed another opinion, which also won't go away and will stay that way. So we don't actually have to change our opinions ever at all. That, those two things can just stay there. Mm -hmm. Somebody can write down mm -hmm. onto the Bitcoin blockchain, one plus one equals foxes. And somebody else mm -hmm. can write down user 5718 that thinks one plus one equals foxes. This is insane and should be drummed out of the human race, like no yeah. agreements necessary. But the blockchain protocol, if it's continued with, will keep those two records and everyone mm -hmm. for as long as it exists will be able to know who said what about what when. And everyone else will be able to agree that yes, that's really what happened and so on. So that's not invaluable but it's not actually necessarily creating a consensus position. Okay. The second thing, the automated market maker is essentially taking advantage of an environment where people are being able to operate asynchronously and in particular non-reputatively. So people can say, I want to buy something and then they can't take it back because it's been recorded somewhere where they can't take things back. So then the automated market maker can create an algorithm that will allow these signals to come in this asynchronous fashion. And because we don't know what order they'll come in, what order they'll be recorded in, there will at least be a fixed algorithm for figuring out who should get what under whatever circumstances they wind up getting recorded. The mm -hmm. issue with the automated market maker is twofold. One, the person operating the market maker is taking a risk because they are in fact acting as a automatic counterparty. So if the system gets hacked, then they will potentially be out everything they have and conceivably more. So they have to create a very conservative market maker to see that doesn't happen to them, which then leads to the second problem, which is that because the market maker is taking this unrestrictable risk, the cost overhead imposed then becomes a transaction cost issue for the market that it's mediating through that okay. blockchain. Any kind of like algorithmic and non-adaptive market maker has this problem that it needs to have a very high transaction cost and any yeah. kind of unfixed adaptive market maker has this problem that maybe it's just trying to evilly screw you personally mm -hmm. and now it has a very high transaction cost so it's very mm -hmm. difficult to negotiate those things properly and that's where market systems like the very popular existing things that like the New York Stock Exchange or the CME Group or London Metals Exchange or somebody like that uses are effectively open algorithms that are adaptive and so can to some extent remain close and safe and then mine would be the other kind of algorithm that's in that bucket of adaptive systems that are also transparent enough that they can be trusted yeah that makes sense i'm going through in my head as you're talking i'm thinking through the automatic market makers that i've used when i was goofing around with crypto and yeah i can see how that is going. Where at the process with Core Disk are you? Is it operating in a few things? Are you in the startup phase, raising money phase? Is it, or what phase are you at with it? We're in startup. There are a handful of people I'm working with who are attempting to set up markets that incorporate the technology and mm -hmm. I'm looking for more. I'm also fighting with the patent office about getting a patent in the United States. 
and they've mm-hmm. gone pure Kafka on that one. They have withdrawn their own notice of acceptance for the second time for reasons which they claim not to be able to understand themselves on the direction of people to whom I cannot speak and may not be identified to me or Congress. That would piss me off. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. (laughs) The technology is also, there's some code that's up on GitHub that's under a Creative Commons Mm -hmm. license that's globally active. So outside the United States, that code can be picked up and used by anybody that cares to under Mm -hmm. that level of Creative Commons. And while they're not enjoined to tell me about it, I would certainly appreciate it if anybody chose to. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting. It's great. Cause it's one of those things that you don't hear every day. And I immediately start thinking, okay, what are the applications? How would you set up a small market? Where would you set it up? Who might be in the, the interested parties that would love to have something like this, whether it's a co-op or a co-op that is actually in the commodities market. And there, there's certain co-op groups that have a reasonably good size of where they could possibly have the suppliers to make something like this meaningful. Yeah. Um, and you could segment the markets tremendously by being able to, you wouldn't all have to go through the single market and you could set up your own private markets if you wanted to almost, depending on your size and scope, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. From my research, my guess is that even somebody with an auctioneer's license at a regional co-op type level or a local co-op type level would probably have the necessary regulatory pieces in place to be able to operate under the licenses that they possess. And such a person may well have the customer base as well to do such a thing. That's it. Super interesting. Where have you seen interest with some of the people who are looking to set up their own small markets already? Has it been any specifics or? I am consulting with a couple of people who are trying to set up blockchain projects and there's a lot Mm -hmm. of fundraising that goes into that. And FTX certainly didn't help them out at all. (laughs) But my kind of leading actor right now is a guy who's an energy trader in South Africa, and he's looking to set up coal and then ultimately like gas and possibly even oil indices. And there's some, a few other people I'm talking to metals in Canada, stuff like that. Yeah. That's super interesting because the commodities market right now with the supply chain constraints that are coming down the pike with the economy and the kind of regionalization of everything. Yeah, some of these things are going viral. Mm -hmm. There was a TikTok from a few weeks ago where the Canadian farmer was, because of the way quotas work there, being forced to dump, I think it was 3,000 gallons of milk on the ground. So that's what his daily milking was and his farm was at its quota. So they weren't allowed to actually store or ship that. And so he was pumping milk onto the ground and he got his phone out and ranted about their starving kids in this country. There's school lunch programs and he sticks his like water bottle in the jug and he's like, this is good milk people. And I'd love to sell it to somebody, but those government whatevers are making me do this. I just saw a video today of a beef rancher talking about contemplating suicide because of how completely insane the beef market is, which is not something that started yesterday. The beef market's been done some absolutely incredible things for decades now. And uh, also Amazon, going back to them, they have Jeremy Clarkson. He's got that sort of reality show about him farming. And again, so the punchline of the first season was that a year of farming with every luxury equipment that money can buy, he had earned 144 pounds on a thousand acres. Now he made some mistakes, obviously, and they also had incredibly bad weather, but this was with 80,000 pounds in subsidies. Like the This is a real farm that was being operated by real people with everything that could be operated for, and it was making effectively zero money. And now in the season to come, in the season that just dropped, he's trying to get a restaurant together to be able to create a local co-op for people to be able to sell their farm goods at prices that are actually economical for the local area. Mm -hmm. And there's a tragic, there's a neighbor of his who's a dairy farmer and they have badgers with tuberculosis and that got passed on to her cows. And so half of the herd that her family raises had to be put down and it's a pure loss basically. 
And if you have a business that has, that's supposed to operate at capacity X and something, you know, runs through and it goes to capacity half X that you're on the ropes and it's very bad. And that's the sort of situation that's just normal and natural, sadly, mm -hmm. in agriculture is just the weather can do things like that to you. Yeah, it's definitely not easy, especially generationally. Um, we forget, we just expect stuff. We've lived through such peaceful times that we just expect stuff to show up. And the reality is that's not how it works at all. And when we see some of the geopolitical strife happening, that's going to affect supply chain, supply lines. It's going to affect when you see different trading partners not wanting to be trading partners anymore. There's a lot that, that happens there. And so by putting this in, the hope is that it increases the transparency, allows, so if you're a speculator, you're just taking your information and forecasting instead of having to actually interact with the contracts. And, and there's, I guess, would be a little bit less money movement, money moving around. There's significantly less information moving around. And so mm -hmm. that they will be able to greatly diminish the amount of money it takes for them to actually operate in the marketplace. Yes. The trick is that the rate of return is much higher. Mm -hmm. So you take a look at what market costs look like. And according to U.S. Census figures, market costs are probably in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars for commodity mm -hmm. exchange in the United States per year. So with my system, the market overhead costs are essentially a parameter. You, When you set the marketplace up, you write that number into the computer program, and then that's how big the spread is. You could take that effectively trillion dollars and shrink it down to half a trillion dollars or a tenth of a trillion dollars, whatever kind of competitive edge you want over the existing market operators is where you would place that. Mm -hmm. And then you'd take whatever number you settled on and decide how much of that pie you want for yourself as the operator. So mm -hmm. let's say you decided that markets should only cost a hundred billion dollars a year. Maybe you can live on $10 billion a year, or maybe you want to live on $50 billion a year. To put this in context, the CME group, who is very much the primary operator of the existing markets has revenues of about $4 billion a year. So mm -hmm. you can pick a number that's larger than the current primary market operator on earth and still do a 90% savings for the actual mm -hmm. farmers and so on, and still have plenty of middle left over to reward people with some information to share. And so that's, once you've got those two things set up, you get your sort of initial group together and figure out what the initial parameters are, and then just let the system going, equilibrating, let the people negotiate mm -hmm. with each other, figure out what they want and what they're going to do. And so mm -hmm. what happens is as that marketplace grows, the returns actually grow with the marketplace. So initial mm -hmm. investments can be very small in a very small market and get an extraordinarily high return because in addition to the high returns that you've already programmed in, there's also the fact that the market that's paying you is larger than the market that you are actually speculating for. And so you just follow that growth up until that market is managing that industry, at which point things mm -hmm. go to a sort of steady state where average returns could be 100% a year or even higher, which mm -hmm. is, I think, Currently, the absolute record for sustained returns, I just saw an article quite recently about Jim Simmons, who is the Fields Medal winner that runs Renaissance Technologies, and their claim, nobody really knows because they're very tight-lipped about it and don't take on investors, is that they're basically building an AI to do all their trading for them, and they've been doing that for decades. Mm. And they do 66% returns a year. It's pretty stout. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. But again, in a CDM, average return rate in the marketplace is just a different number you plug into the computer. So you plug in mm -hmm. a number like 200, and then that's the average rate of return for the speculators in the marketplace. And you'd be doing three times better than Renaissance Technologies. Yeah, that's interesting. So would this help any with some of the bullwhip stuff that we've seen with supply chains? Because it's going to be more coordinated and more cooperative where... You don't have people over-ordering stuff as much because they have a better insight and transparency into the market? I believe it will because one of the things about the bullwhip, again, is that 
with existing markets being these positive reinforcement machines, not only mm -hmm. do they have a tendency to cause bullwhip type behaviors, they'll have a tendency to mm -hmm. exacerbate bullwhip type behaviors once they develop. And those are very profitable because sharp turns in the marketplace mm -hmm. are incredibly profitable for the people that are figuring who can appropriately navigate them. What this does is it completely reverses the incentives for that speculative interest. So if mm -hmm. a bull whip exists or develops, then there's a lot of money to be made in figuring out how to counteract it and how to smooth it out and make it go away mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's not good business sense for people to over order and then have waste and then it's better business sense for people to operate in ways that are stably coordinated across time and space. And so yeah. while there's obviously going to be limits to that, if an earthquake or the sky falls or whatever, there's going to be things that happen that will cause disasters. A marketplace that takes those sorts of events on board and then attempts to navigate through them in the calmest way possible is going to do a lot less harm than a marketplace that takes those on board and effectively exacerbates them because they're now enormous money pots that if you can push them to even greater heights become even bigger pinatas that you can shake people down for. Yeah. I feel like my mind is full now. Wow. Such a fascinating technology, fascinating application. It's very remarkable. I'll be, I'll be maybe thinking on this for a while, man. I really appreciate you coming and talking to me about this and how can people get a hold of you if they want to talk about this, if they're interested in finding out more about fundraising, any raising that you have, what would be the best way to, to get in contact with you? The best way to get in touch with me is my email, noahphealy at yahoo.com will find me pretty directly. <laughs> and uh, you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn, Noah Healy. I'm the oldest Noah Healy there is, so it's just my name. There's a website. Okay. You can learn more about coordinated discovery markets along with some of the math behind the technology. There's a white paper there and some links to videos of that I produced a couple. And there's also some just general intro stuff on game theory and metric spaces at cordisc.com. Okay. Awesome. Man, I really appreciate you coming and talking to us and I'm struggling to even know what to say. I've enjoyed this so much that it's leaving me speechless. So I appreciate the time. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. This was a good conversation. Awesome.